Hi, my name is Stephanie Jackson, and I'm a member of the Technical Leadership for Elastic Cloud, focused on improving our reliability and scalability and improving our ability to scale for the future. I've worked in the computer industry for over 20 years, and I've been lucky enough to use the Elastic Stack since uh, 0.19. This talk represents about six months worth of off and on exploration into whether or not the Elastic Stack could measure service level indicators and service level objectives. Spoiler, it can do so today and will do so even better for the future. Once I determined it was possible, I then did more research into best practices. I volunteered for this project because improving reliability is something I feel very passionate about. And I knew we needed a better basis for stability discussions than gut feelings and incomplete data. I admit, I didn't realize when I jumped on this train exactly how much math would be involved, but I've learned that now. So buckle up. Today, we're gonna to cover how to measure, report, and alert on service level indicators and service level objectives using the Elastic Stack. Should you have any questions while I'm talking, please drop them in chat. Before we get into the nitty, <clears throat> nitty gritty of the presentation, I'm gonna do a brief overview of the terminology that I'll be using and the infrastructure that we are measuring so that we're all on the same page. Google created these terms some time ago and mostly just borrowed their definitions. Google has several good books on this topic and other SRE topics that are available for free if you want more information. In order to keep us all on the same page, I wanna walk you through a set of examples. The example I'm going to use is a website. Most websites are already ingesting HTTP logs and HTTP status codes somewhere. If we wanted to know how our website is performing, we would determine what we consider successful status codes, often anything less than 500, sometimes only in the 200 to 399 range. And then we'd measure how many requests we're getting. Our service level indicator would then be what percentage of requests are successful. Then we could work with the business to determine what level of availability we want to target. Perhaps we've determined that if the success rate drops below 99%, we sell significantly fewer products. So we'd wanna make sure that we were always above that level. Service level objectives are usually determined by product managers and leadership as a target we want to maintain. An agreed upon service level objective allows us to have a data-driven basis for good conversations about prioritization of new features versus reliability fixes across the platform. It also gives us an unambiguous signal of where we stand on availability. A service level agreement is essentially a service level objective with a monetary impact. It's a contractual agreement with our customers that has penalties if we don't meet it. Usually things like um, refunds or credits for the future, depending on what level we hit. For the purpose of this talk, I'm mostly gonna focus on service level indicators and service level objectives. One other term that often comes up around service level indicators and service level objectives are error budgets. An error budget is how much downtime you have left in a period before your users start being unhappy and you risk service level objective breach. Error budgets are often used to speed up or slow down the pace of change in an environment. We're not currently using these much, but we hope to in the future. Terminology aside, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're measuring. Um, Elastic Cloud is a very large platform that scales the globe. The scale and growth of Elastic Cloud ends up making everything that we're doing here significantly harder. To give you an idea, when I was making this slide, I refused to give an exact number for global regions because it changes so fast that it's always wrong. We have to deal with coming up with a method that works on all the major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and GCP, as well as allowing us to have a single pane of glass that works despite the latency to different regions around the globe. In order to observe all of this, we have our own internal observability platform that we use. Here's some stats on our observability platform. We ingest over 100 terabytes a day into that platform, which includes logs and metrics across all regions combined. We manage more than 150 Elasticsearch deployments as part of our observability platform. And the platform includes logging clusters, 
where we send text-based logs, metrics clusters, where we send metrics, uh, metric beat metrics and APM metrics, and more. The node count can include master nodes, data nodes, and machine learning nodes. The stack itself uh, ranges the entire Elastic stack. It includes APM and beats to push data to Logstash, which in turn ingests into our regional observability deployments. We try to keep all of this as close to current release as possible. And today, everything is currently running 7.14. In order to manage something of this scale, we use a bunch of different tools, including an internal tool to synchronize users, dashboards, index patterns, and things of that variety across all the deployments. We're also using the Elastic Cloud Terraform provider and cross-cluster search within cloud. Now we get to the actual details. When I started this journey, we had a lot of rich data in our observability deployments, but no real way to translate that to a good overview of the health of our platform. A lot of our monitoring was based on thresholds and error numbers, which didn't necessarily translate well across different size regions. And we lacked the ability to measure an overview of most processes on a global level. I knew we needed to break this down into smaller pieces. First, we needed to make the process of getting the data into our platform as easy as possible. Second, we needed to roll up summarized data so that we could look at larger time periods without impacting how much data we were looking at. And third, we needed to be able to visualize it. This is what I ended up with as the more detailed step-by-step -step guide. We instrument the code itself and then ingest the data using either custom APM metrics libraries, file beat, or metric beat into our regional deployments. There, we're using transforms. Transforms enable you to convert existing Elasticsearch indices into summarized indices, which provide opportunities for new insights and analytics. They're exactly what we needed here. We're using them to pivot the data to calculate service level indicators and store them in a separate summarized index. We then have regional dashboards to allow a regional analysis of issues for anything that might be focused on one specific region or for a specific incidence or debugging. Those regional clusters are set up with cross cluster search on our overview cluster using tagging and the Elastic Cloud Terraform provider so that we can then create global dashboards to get an overview of everything. Going into the different pieces in a little bit more details, the APM agent allows for custom metrics libraries, which we're using extensively, in addition to all of the APM data. A metrics library, such as Prometheus Client, based, can be wired into the APM data, into the APM agent, and pointed at the right Elastic Cloud location. We also can calculate based on file beat data, for example, HTTP logs, metric beat data, any metric that metric beat can output, or anything else that can be ingested. Essentially, if it can go into Elasticsearch, we can use it to calculate SLIs. As I mentioned, to calculate an SLI, the first step is to decide what is considered successful events and what are considered valid events. Going back to our original example, we might define successful events as any website event with a status code less than 500, and all events, any log entry with a status code field that exists. For things like latency, the queries and structure will be different, but the general idea is the same. Because of the scale and scope of what we're doing, we have to keep summarized data in order to look back over a longer time period we'd like to be able to track service level indicators over about a year so that we can keep an idea of trends and the raw data for some of the indexes that we're looking at was simply too large to deal with. We needed a tool to transform that into data that we could use longer term. We started out with Watcher, which worked out okay, but had a couple of significant flaws. There was no ability to backfill data within the tool. So we either had to accept that history started whenever we created the first watch, or we had to write some variety of additional tooling in order to backfill that data. Watcher also doesn't keep track of what data it had already managed, which meant ingest delays or cluster issues 
would mean that we lost the ability to look at this data. And if you've used it, the UI for Watcher is a little cryptic and hard to figure out. Transforms fixed all of the issues that we had with Watcher, and they're what we're currently using. Transforms manage historical data and backfill correctly, and it has a much cleaner and easier to use UI. Before Lens formulas, we were calculating percentage and storing that as well using a bucket script aggregation. But with the introductions of Lens formulas, we're using those instead. More details on that shortly. We're also using ingest pipelines to allow us to enrich the data as required with things like local region, cloud provider, and SLO identifier. What we end up with is a number of documents that look like this. Um, these are all rolled up over one minute and includes details, like I said, about region, SLO identifier, as well as the number of successful events, total events, and before lens formulas, also percent. We then use this data to feed our visualization, both regionally and globally. If you haven't used Lens, you really should because it is a truly awesome tool. When I started looking into how to visualize this, Lens did 99% of what I needed really well. Enhancement requests to the stack teams as part of the process of discovery improve the ability to create Lens dashboards for service level objectives. Two enhancement requests that came out in 7.14 were auto scaling to data bounds and formulas. Auto scaling to data bounds allowed us the ability to see the nuances between 99% and 99.99%, as you can see in this graph, but also to show full outages down to 0% in the rare case that that happens. We're also using formulas to recalculate over different time periods and to summarize globally, as you'll see going forward. All of the data is set up and stored in our regional clusters, and we have dashboards set up both regionally and globally. Lens formulas were a really key part of setting up all of these visualizations. Before we got to lens formulas, we had no really good way to visualize different time periods without having to retransform the data for larger time periods. Although we had data per minute, there was no easy way to look at things, say, over a month or over a quarter in a way that was consistent and accurate. Having the ability to recalculate the percentage successful automatically based on the Kibana time filter is a game changer. We also needed to be able to display global data accurately. Because all of our regions tend to be different size and some of our regions are larger than others, simply averaging the percentage successful would not get us an accurate number. We needed to be able to re-add the successful events and re-add all the events and then recalculate the percentage based on whatever filters were set. As you can see, that is exactly what we're doing here. We're also using cross-cluster search extensively to create this single pane of glass. We use the Elastic Cloud Terraform provider use, using to tag the regional hosts and set up named remotes on our overview cluster. As mentioned, we have different types of observability deployments in each region, so we name them based on function and region. For example, our logging cluster from US East 1 is called Logging US East 1. From there, we can use cross-cluster search to search across multiple regions in the same function by using wildcards. As you can see here, we're looking at the SLO aggregations index pattern across all logging remote clusters. Should we wish to search across all remotes, we can do that as well using the same wildcard. As I mentioned earlier, we're doing cross-cluster search to over 150 different clusters across the globe. And I continue to be truly shocked at how well that is working and how much this has been a game changer for our ability to both calculate service level indicators and service level objectives, but also to debug issues on a broader scale. As noted, we're using lens formulas here as well to recalculate percentages based on the visualized data. And from there, we get a single pane of glass that looks 
very similar to the same one that we have regionally. Um, our global single pane of glass allows for a global view of service level objectives and the ability to display data at different organizational levels. Someone in leadership may want to see quarter over quarter um, to see trends for availability for the last period of time. Someone on call may need to do a more nuanced debugging of something that might have happened in the past few minutes. Having the ability to use Kibana to do this can allow us to filter to individual regions, as well as look at whatever time span makes sense. We also have some basic alerting on service level objective breach. This is used to enrich our other alert streams, such as synthetics and health checks. We're using it both as a warning notification that things are trending in the wrong direction to individual teams, as well as paging the people on call if things get particularly bad. Today, we're using Watcher for all of this, but we'll be pivoting to using Kibana alerting in the near future. The switch from using Watcher to using alerting is pretty obvious. The alerting platform gives us out of the box suppression, deduplication, analytics, routing, all of the alerting platform features that you would want that Watcher unfortunately does not give us. And that gets us into what happens next. With any project of this sort, we have a large number of things that are work in progress and always more things that we would like to do. To start with, We'd like to increase cloud service level objective coverage to 100% of all cloud applications and infrastructure. This gives us the ability to provide a more stable cloud platform, as well as the ability to continue to use our cutting edge observability products. As part of that, we want to make sure that the ability to other, for others to use this is an ongoing thing that we're working on. I get to ask for all the features that I could dream of and get them built into the product. I've had the luck of working at the same company as many of the developers for the stack features, which has made it easier for me to figure out how to do this. As I've shown here, this is already something that anyone can do today with the tools currently available. And we're using this across our cloud platform today. I've seen how powerful it can be for our own organization and I want to keep making this easier and easier for new users to the Elastic Stack. The other piece that I'm really interested to investigate as part of the switch from Watcher to alerting is to start using error budgets and start alerting with more nuance on potential SLO breach. Craig is doing a talk during Elasticon as well titled Observability Technology Preview new and exciting innovation from the Elastic Observability team. You should check that out either live or as a recording because it includes a very interesting feature around error budget monitoring that I cannot wait to try out. It's a really exciting time to be working on these things. This has been a fascinating project to work on and has only increased my admiration for how easy it is to do a number of things across the Elastic stack. Thank you for listening, and I hope you took something from this that you can use for the future.